Or, I'm very excited and honored to welcome the keynote speaker tonight. It's an amazing story. He applied to college the same year I did, and I wrote a bunch of college essays and had to you know, check my spelling. He didn't bother to do the college essays. Instead, he wrote a computer program, a game, and he sent that to the college acceptance board, and he got into UNC based on a computer game. And I didn't get in based on my essays. So uh, very, very, I wish I could relive life and do some computer gaming back then. Anyway, Todd Harris became a computer programmer, went into the FinTech industries, and quite a long time ago decided there was a more fun thing to do than counting the money, counting gamers. So he started a company called High Res, which now has, listen to this, 70 million people playing their games. Think about that. You're excited to have 1,000 customers. 70 million customers playing their games. 450 employees just up in Alpharetta. And he has started a new business that I think is going to be the NFL 20 years from now. What does the NFL do? They run a bunch of football games. Todd has started a business called Skill Shot that runs computer tournaments. Thousands of people come for days on end and watch people play computer games. Eventually, we will be doing this on TV. Your kids will be, have computer gaming icons as their, you know, uh, people they want to grow up and be. Just unbelievable. Todd is changing the world. Todd, come up and tell us about it, please. Todd Harris, everyone. Thank you very much. Jim? How about that? Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks for making it in the rain. Thanks for the hospitality. Um, I have had the benefit to visit China probably half dozen, eight times uh, in business. The hospitality has always been amazing. Here in the South, we do hospitality well, but we can learn some things from China. And uh, similarly, the hospitality leading up to this event has been amazing. So thanks for your attention, and, and thanks for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. Um, the topic today is gaming and esports, uh, and particularly uh, around the relation between the US and China. Uh, Vivian, if you can hit the next slide. And um, please contact me. I post about the gaming and esports industry quite a lot on Twitter and LinkedIn, and that's my email as well. I'm very passionate, as you will soon discover, about this topic because I think gaming and esports is going to help uh, improve the world a little bit in addition to. Uh, to being a good business. So um, please reach out to me and I'm happy to engage there. Here's the question that I kind of want to explore uh, tonight with you guys. Um, the China market for video games is the largest in the world. There's a little asterisk there, which we'll get to, because um, we had a blip last year. And that blip was related to the fact that it's also very highly regulated, very different to the way the game industry works in the US, and we're going to talk about that. It's also true that it uh, has a notorious reputation, which I would say is accurate, for poor protection of intellectual property. We're going to explore that a little bit. How are companies managing this landscape today, and what does the future look like? And why do I personally believe that this concept of esports or games played competitively is so critical to future growth. But first of all, why does this really matter? How many people in this audience consider themselves to be a gamer? I know there's one man in the front. <laughs> and I know Jim plays a lot of World of Warcraft. We got a couple. And then has anyone attended an in-person esports event? Nobody. Okay, prepare to have your minds blown just a little bit. Um, let's advance the slide. Okay, economically, the largest entertainment in the, in the world, largest entertainment industry by far is the gaming industry. You take all of the film industry and all of the music industry and you put them together and gaming dwarfs that. 
$140 billion a year globally and growing on every single platform. So from an economic impact standpoint, it's worth paying attention to. From a fandom perspective, the passion level of gamers is beyond traditional, what we call stick and ball sports. So the fandom just within the United States is over 150 million, basically equal to the National Hockey League and Major League Baseball combined. Today, only the NFL has more fandom. Next slide. If you're interested in the world of media consumption, what are people watching in terms of live video or video on demand? The platform Twitch, who's heard of Twitch? This was bought by Amazon for $970 million a few years ago. It's a place where you, maybe not you, maybe you, and me, watch other people play video games live. And this platform has a higher audience already than ESPN or CNN down the road. On YouTube, which is a video on demand platform primarily, pre-recorded videos, the amount of content of people playing games is about equal to the total content of Netflix. So people are consuming the content of watching other people play video games on YouTube versus all of Netflix. And if you're concerned about your future, what are your kids going to be playing and what are their kids going to be playing and watching? The traditional sports audience is graying. This is the average age of the viewer on traditional television of the major US sports. And other than soccer, this age tends to go up one year every two years. Esports is higher than you might have suspected. You probably thought it was 13. No, it's 25. But that is a young demographic. So if you care about the next generation of worker, or the next generation of consumer, or the next generation of citizen or voter, esports you should pay attention to. And finally, esports and gaming will make the world a better place. Last weekend, we at Skillshot, in advance of the Super Bowl, went to Miami and we partnered with two NFL legends, Jerry Rice and Steve Young. This demographic might know those names. Those football legends helped, along with Skillshot, us open an eSports center for a community that might not otherwise have access. We partnered with the YWCA and provided 16 computers so that that population can play games and also get exposed to STEM. Because I've seen firsthand that gaming is a gateway to technology, computer programming, and STEM. It gets kids in the door. And then by accident, they learn job skills, which are critical for the next generation. That was Saturday. On Sunday, we partnered with Make-A-Wish Georgia. The young man in the middle is Ethan. Ethan has been undergoing treatment for cancer for over 1,000 days. Make-A-Wish Georgia granted his wish. Most kids want to go to Disney World, maybe meet an idol, a rock and roll star. Ethan's dream was to create a game called Protocol that highlighted his, his battle against cancer, where the hero, Ethan, would unite with other characters, and as a team, they would undergo highs and lows, and it would be a model for other people suffering with this disease. We worked over the weekend with uh, Kennesaw State. Three teams worked on a prototype of his game, and the winning team will now work for six months to release this game in July, corresponding with Ethan's final day of treatment. Pretty exciting. So yeah, gaming's gonna help us repair the world a little bit. Um, so let's return to our question. Um, and let's take them piece by piece. So maybe if you can advance this once. The China market for video games is the world's largest. There's a lot of people in China, as you guys know. 
and there's a lot of gamers in China. It used to be that the players of video games on the PC platform alone was equal to the entire population of the United States, over 300 million players of PC games. Recently, mobile gaming has exploded, which has doubled the number of gamers. So there's now about 600 million PC and mobile games in China. So you basically more or less twice the population of the United States, and that's your addressable market. Also, there's about 200 public companies in China that are in the game industry, about 6,000 total game developers in China. And the total revenue of the China market is about $35 billion. Basically, if you take the total game market, it's almost evenly split between China and the United States. So it's about $35 billion each for gaming. Massive market. That means that despite challenges, companies both domestically and globally are going to pay attention to that market. Highly, highly regulated. Here in the US, one young man or woman with an idea can make a game and they can publish it on the PC platform or the app store with very little friction. It's actually one of the challenges here is, is discovery. There's so much content. Every day, for the iPhone, 500 new games are published. Standing out is very difficult. In China, it's the exact opposite. Every game that will be monetized in a way that is not ads, which is the majority of gaming content, needs a license from the government. So if I have a game concept, whether I'm a US developer or a domestic Chinese developer, before I can publish that game, I need a publisher's license. And that is a very complex requirement of the government reviewing the content for the game. And this has been in place for quite a while. But in 2018, the rules changed dramatically. And this has nothing to do with current US-China trade policies. It has more to do with the fact that China seems to be balancing the economic benefit with the social impact from a cultural standpoint. There may also have been an element of domestic versus foreign. That is a little speculative. But clearly, the rules changed. And in 2018, there was a six-month period where no new games were approved. That's the asterisk. That's why for the year 2019, China, after multiple years of being number one, fell to slightly number two, because literally no new games were published for six months. And I think that was a tens of billions of dollar impact to the valuation of Tencent, who's the major game player in China. It was a clear show of how critical the government approval process is to the games industry. Fortunately, things are flowing again. But we, in the Q&A section, I'm happy to address this more. We have firsthand experience of partnering with Tencent, going through and getting two games approved. But the reality is, it is a shifting landscape. And the rules um, change. To give you some examples of rules that are put in place, um, there's no, and there hasn't for years, there's no red blood. You know, some games are more gory and more mature. But in China, you cannot show blood. For many years, there was a simple fix for that. You made the blood green. That was the fix. That got through the approval process. But now, not so clear. Maybe even green blood is not allowed. Another recent uh, change is what is called anti-addiction or anti-indulgence. Um, it is limiting playtime or limiting play hours. Might be for the best, but it's a new rule that has to be navigated. So this is something very particular to the China market that also requires a Chinese domestic partner or JV. There is, it is not possible for a non-Chinese company to get a game approved. 
hence my half a dozen trips to China and working with a local partner. Notoriously poor protection of intellectual property. So maybe we'll get to this in the panel, but from a games industry standpoint, this is a very real challenge. Um, it manifests itself in a few different ways. Number one, taking the exact code and using it. I've seen it many, many times. Bugs and all. The exact code is now available under someone else's name. Number two, taking the art or IP without license and using that. The number of times that Batman is in a game without any approval from Warner Brothers and Batman is very high. So taking that art. Number three, extremely competent, fast following. Production of a game, another game that looks exactly like it is out. We experienced this firsthand at high res. We had a game called Realm Royale. Within a matter of months, more or less the exact same game, not our code, not our art, but just a fast follow was available in the China market. All right, how do companies manage these challenges today? Um, there are companies that are working within the system and those that are working somewhat around the system. Within the system, it is all about partnering with a quality Chinese company. In the gaming industry, the leader by far is Tencent, and NetEase is also another uh, company with significant partnerships and significant growth. And when I was at HiRes, we partnered with Tencent, and that meant they were there on the ground helping to navigate this approval process, and also helping take our game content, even if it's approved, and localizing it for the Chinese market. So that means more than translation. One of the new rules, by the way, is no English is allowed. You will get rejected if you have any English in your game. But more than that, um, there's uh, you know, a cultural sensitivity around the depiction of skeletons and bones, it's something that is different in the Chinese market, not allowed, not, so, not such a concern in the US, but not appropriate there. That means changing art. And um, in many cases, there were also other slight tweaks to make the art more appealing to that audience, basically localizing the product. So that's kind of the within the system, and that's what the majority of content is doing. There also are ways to kind of be in the gray. Um, there's a platform called Steam, which is kind of, you all probably know iTunes. It's kind of like the iTunes of PC gaming. And Steam is not in China, but it's accessible to China. And so uh, probably four years ago, there were no Chinese gamers on Steam. Uh, two years ago, 25% of the population was uh, from China, and now probably close to 50% is from China. So this is a platform that exists somewhat outside, but for both domestic companies and US companies, it's available for now. It takes some work to access it. The spigot might be turned off, but it's available for now. So that's, you're kind of within or without. That's how companies are navigating it. All right. So finally, what does the future look like? Why is eSports so critical? Um, and eSports, again, just backing way up, eSports is the concept that you're not just playing the game, you're playing the game competitively and cooperatively with other people. You're really into it, just like you're into basketball or soccer, and the level of play and production is so high that other people are watching. So, um, a couple points. The future, number one, is very mobile. Mobile gaming has by far eclipsed PC gaming in China, and it's still growing very rapidly. And that trend will continue in the West. It ha it's not quite as prominent, but it's a very mainstream there, um, and it's going to affect other markets. So the future is very mobile. The future. Um, also is very eSports centric. And I, I believe this because I think that the government of China 
sees esports as being more healthy than gaming. The perception of a gamer, earned or not earned, is solitary, in your room, eating Doritos, not healthy. Not so true, but that's the perception. Esports takes that lone gamer and makes him or her cooperate with teammates. And all the benefits of traditional sports, communication, mastery, teaming, you start to see legitimately developed. Esports also has an economic development angle because now you're building venues and arenas. Here in the US, there's a $50 million arena that Comcast is sponsoring. There's one in Arlington, tens of millions of dollars. And in China, add many, many zeros. So the fact that you can get these solitary gamers moving, cooperating, contributing to real estate development. China happens to have some amazingly good teams, which helps national prominence. It's much more of a cultural uh, export, if you will. And so last year, the government recognized two esports professions for the first time. The idea of a pro player and the idea of a tournament operator were recognized by the government as legitimate professions. A survey done about a month ago in Shanghai said that being an esports professional was the top career choice for Chinese youth. And I'm not surprised because you're going to see the same thing in the US in about five years. So esports is critical for China. The same wave will come to the United States and to Western markets as well. Finally, one small bit of encouraging news for the gaming industry out of the phase one trade agreement is there was some uh, threat that tariffs would apply to the gaming consoles, the Xbox and the PlayStation. Now to be clear, those don't drive most of the activity in China. It's mobile, it's PC. But the, that hardware is made in China. And in a fairly unusual move, the companies behind, so Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo all jointly drafted uh, a letter that said that if tariffs were put in place, the impact passed to the American consumer would be some exorbitant number. And based on that, in this last trade, there, uh, there will not be tariffs. And the timing is very good for that because this holiday season, there are new releases of those major platforms. The future's bright. Thanks for your attention. My final commercial is, um, you know, we've been active in the gaming space now for over 15 years. And for anyone out here who has a company who wants to understand what I think is gonna be the future of sports and entertainment, wants to connect your brand with these engaged fans, Skillshot is here for you. We'd love to serve you. Thank you very much. How do you do that? How do you connect with these fans? If I'm Coca-Cola or Bank of America, or, or some, is it a normal sponsorship? Am I gonna go find a kid to put a Coca-Cola logo on him and he's my he's our team player? Um, it's a little bit like traditional sports sponsorships, but there's always, it, it starts with authenticity. Like if it, if it just feels like only a logo slap and not support of the community, the gaming audience tends to turn off. But when you are supporting their passion, then they are more loyal than the sponsor of sports. With Coca-Cola, when I was at high res we partnered with them around, we had a world championship up the road in Cobb Energy Center. So, you know, 3,000 screaming fans watching the world championship. This is a small event, by the way. How long did they sit there? I know yeah, the answer. Three days, eight hours a day. They sat and watched video games for 24 hours. That's right. And not everyone could fit in that theater. So we partnered with Coca-Cola in their Coke theaters and about 40 theaters around the United States, we simulcast 
that production. So if you were in Los Angeles, you could gather with fans in the theater just for the final match, not three days, but for the final match, enjoy your fizzy beverage, get some swag, some goodies in the game, and that's the sort of experience that uh, created a lot of loyalty for that brand that supported them. So it's, it's taking traditional sports sponsorship models but adopting it to this audience, and then you tend to see return. We'll take one or two questions now, and then we're going to bring up the rest of the panel. But ma'am, I saw your hand. Go ahead. Yes. So in Riot Games has their big, whatever they're called, in the stadiums. Do they run on your platform, or do they have their own platforms, or is this a competitive thing? Yeah, it's a great question. There's not a, this slide of games, tournaments, teams, events, content studio, is about half of the actual ecosystem. It's a pretty complex, wild west world, which is why we try to help partners navigate it. Riot is a publisher, which means they make a game. They make a game called League of Legends, which is very, very popular. It's now going on its 10th year, and China is their biggest market. Um, Shanghai will host the next League of Legends finals uh, in 2020, and they hosted a few years ago, and China actually had the winning team a few years ago as well. So in their case, they do a lot of the tournament production themselves, but they are uh, more of a, they would be a competitor with high res studios who makes other games, but for Skillshot, they would be a potential partner and client, and we're actively talking with them. My 13-year-old son would have loved to have been here and just pointing at me, Dad, I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> this kid sits in front of a computer screen, not even playing the game, listening to a commentary. And this, this to me is mind-boggling. Reminded me, 15 years ago, I had a dopey uh, cousin, and he used to come late to family get-togethers because he was playing online chess with some stranger on this thing called AOL. I go, what a loser. <laughs> You know, this is reality. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes, Todd. Oh, yeah. I really I mean, enjoyed listening to you. Th thanks. Uh -huh. And yeah, and you know, it seems really weird until the kid says, well, you watch football and you don't play yeah. football. You watch golf. Some of you watch cars drive in a circle. <laughs> like, this is an intellectual sport. This is chess plus plus. This is a highly demanding intellectual sport where people don't injure themselves and there's no contact. It is the future. It is not the past. If all of us today had been playing video games, and I said, I got a great idea. Here's what we're going to do. Instead of the video game, instead of being on that computing device, right, put on a helmet and bash into those other guys outside. There may be a risk of injury, like up to your brain, but let's do that. No one would think that's a good idea. No one would think that's a good idea. This is the future. All right. Are you uh, uh, a parent? I am. I have of a serious gamer. Uh, how old is he? Well, so my daughter gamed for a while. She's now a sophomore in college and busy and not gaming. <laughs> my son is 17. He's exceptionally good at uh, a few games. And what are your family's rules mm, good question. around the gaming? I got to know because right. I got me some kids too. and. So I'll, I am one of the gamers he was pointing at and making fun of, and I will tell you this. We play World of Warcraft in our house, which about a million people pay 30 bucks a month to play. And I'll tell you this, I have children who live all over the country. We get together as a family on World of Warcraft and go kill stuff together. And that may sound really dorky, but you know what my 22-year-old son wants from me? What does your child want from you? Time. Isn't that what your children want from you? An interest in whatever they're interested in? My son and I go and play a video game for a couple of hours. He considers it as if I spent two hours at the table with him. To him, it's no different. And at the side, we're chatting back and forth, you know. How'd you do on your test last week? How's your girlfriend Holly doing? He, I found out that he dumped Holly on chat while we were playing World of Warcraft. And so for us, as a family, it's actually been a wonderful thing that we've really enjoyed. And so I'm blown away by this, but I have to admit that I'm part of the solution. Tell me, what are your rules as a family, right. as a daddy? It, 
It took a while to navigate this with my wife, I have to say. We come from different spots. It's my life blood. Um, but where we ended up was in a couple places. So some families choose to limit screen time, and I totally get it. Um, that wasn't really where I was coming from, because personally I see it as limiting book time or paper time. I think it's ridiculous. It's a format. It's all about the content itself, not the media form, in my mind. I think it's an old, outdated notion. But I'm big on the concept of balance. So for us, uh, it was very important that he maintained his grades. And when he was young, we basically insisted that he was doing something that involved motion and fitness. Because as much as I'm into the teamwork, we don't quite have the fitness with gaming. So that was our agreement. Uh, we made him play soccer, which he didn't, wasn't too into, but he did it for a long time. He did it through high school. He's now a junior. And then two years ago, he tried cross country. Something about cross country and his gamer brain like clicked because it's very quantifiable and objective. And like a game, if you put in the time, you will see improvement. It may not be the fastest, but your time will improve. This is very much like game loops. Games are designed to yield improvement if you put in the time. So he's now a very serious cross-country runner, and he's probably spending more time with that in gaming, but that was, that was his choice, and he migrates in gaming. Every family has to obviously do what makes sense. My one, here's my one plea. If your kid is playing a multiplayer game versus a single player game, realize and talk with that child. I know to you it seems silly that when you say dinner's ready, turn off that game, he or she doesn't come right away. But if they're playing a competitive multiplayer game, that is equivalent to dragging them off the basketball court while their team is in the middle of a game. They are letting their teammates down, and it will go on their permanent record. That is the analogy. Now, I'm not saying if you use it as a teachable moment to say, if the game takes between 20 minutes and 40 minutes, and we're going to have dinner here, you know you can't start a game before then, right? But realize what they are participating in, what level of importance it means to them and their teammates, and if you wouldn't drag them out in the middle of the basketball game, don't kick them out of the online game without any warning. This young man right here deserves to ask a question. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, what game did you design for your college? That's a great question. So my, the, the, oh, sorry, Aaron's question was what game I submitted uh, to my college. It was a very modest game. Um, it was actually, I made a game for my younger sister for her birthday. And it had pretty simple mechanics. She uh, this was back in the days when you didn't have a mobile phone. She had to invite all of her friends by shooting a phone cord and contacting her friends and invite them to attend her party. And every once in a while, her older brother's big goofy head would pop in like the boss and try to mess it up. And I spent a lot of time on it. It had a little bit of humor in it. It was personal to me, and that's what I submitted. Um, going back beyond that, the reason I feel kind of passionate about PC gaming and we opened these centers is when I was in seventh grade, you know, my, my dad was a programmer at IBM for like 30 years. And we were fortunate, he got one of the first IBM PCs that were available. They didn't have a lot of supply. And when I got that, I thought, I'm gonna grow up and make games. And that um, led me to learn computer programming, to learn technology. I didn't work in the game industry for 20 more years. I just did software development in the fintech industry. But that exposed me to this world, and it helped me that I wasn't just a consumer of games, I was a creator. And uh, some percentage of gamers will also follow a similar path, and that's uh, very needed these days. All right, great. Todd, why don't you go ahead and have a seat, and All let's right. bring up the rest Thanks, of the guys. panelists. Fascinating, isn't it? Mind